The inexorable rise in dementia, a worldwide problem with no solution in sight. Why is medical science still baffled to its cause and cure? And turbulent times on the world's airliners are on the increase. Why are those unexpected bumps mid-flight so unpredictable? And are we right to be scared by them? I'm Martin Stanford. This is Insight. Welcome to Insight. Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia, affecting an estimated 44 million people worldwide. Some estimates suggest that only one in four people with the disease have actually got a diagnosis. The exact cause is unknown, although a number of factors, such as a lifetime of poor health and diet, are thought to increase your risk of developing the condition. So far, there is no cure. Insight's Dana Lewis reports. What's seven from 100? Um. It suddenly started seven years ago. Sue Townsend was only 53 then. First it was called dementia, and then as her memory slipped away, the condition worsened. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Are you able to tell me what year it is? 2000 and... And what month of the year are we in? We're in... Could you have a guess? What month do you think we're in? Beautiful trees here, aren't they? Her longtime partner, Barbara, almost always by her side, says she can't be left alone for long. For Sue, everyday challenges are hard to navigate through a confusing, foggy, mental obstacle course. She said to me, um, oh, do, would you like a cup of coffee? And I'll say, yes, OK. And then about five minutes, she'll come back and say, what was it I was going to do? <laughs> and so, yeah, it's, it's yeah, kind of hard yeah. to keep a focus on the task yeah. that you're going to do, yeah. isn't it? Yes. So... It's frustrating sometimes. Yeah. Is it frustrating or do you kind of learn to live with it? Yeah, it well, it, it just, it's just me now, you know. Alzheimer's kills more people than breast and prostate cancer combined and is the leading cause of death for women aged over 80. With our aging population worldwide, nearly 44 million people have Alzheimer's or a related dementia. And the global cost is said to be over $600 billion in increasing. The University of Reading's Memory Clinic, just outside of London, studies hundreds of patients. Some are on experimental medicines. Researcher Rosie Sibley says it is a desperate and very human hunt for treatments that hold promise to at least ease the symptoms of a very cruel disease. It's horrible. It is horrible. Um, and, and actually, to a certain extent, there is nowhere to turn because your experience of living with that individual is unique. Um, so people describe it as a bereavement even before um, the person does pass away and they're watching the person in front of them disappear. Researchers know Alzheimer's essentially shrinks the brain and abnormal amyloid plaques or proteins choke out clusters of brain cells. One of Reading's leading scientists is Dr. Mark Dallas. We're at a tipping point, I would say. Uh, I think we've got evidence that we can target some of the uh, cascades involved in the disease. He's referring to a new and unprecedented year-long study just published in the journal Nature. A new drug called aducanumab is a so-called antibody and appears to have at least reduced amyloid plaques in patients. The higher the dose, the more dramatic the results. It showed that we could reduce one of the, the toxic elements in the, the disease process. What the study didn't show was whether it can actually lead to an improvement in the, the cognition or the brain function of these patients that were taking, taking the actual treatment itself. Researchers around the world, including here at Reading University, believe that they're about to turn the corner on an earlier diagnosis and then eventually the treatment for Alzheimer's. The need is great. Right now, one in three people over the age of 65 develop dementia, and the vast majority of those go on and get full Alzheimer's disease. 
While new research into slowing the disease is promising, that doesn't mean removing the plaques restores brain function. So Dr. Dallas's research into finding earlier diagnosis of Alzheimer's becomes all the more critical. I know you hate the word cure, but if you, if you were to look 10 or 20 years ahead, uh, do you think we're at least that far out for a really effective treatment? Uh, I think 20 years is more realistic. You know, I'd like to think in 10 years' time, we're certainly getting new drugs into the pipeline and targeting new avenues. And I think that's something that's exciting in the scientific community. I think it will be a combination of treatments that will eventually combat Alzheimer's disease. I don't think it's going to be one magic bullet or one magic pill. So simple things like eating right and staying active is a natural form of treatment. Sue still tries to do that and says she's always been a joker and sometimes uses it to cover her gaps in memory. Can I ask you to spell the word world for me? W-O-R-L-D. And could you spell that backwards for me? Oh. <laughs> Very good. Could you spell the word backwards for me? <laughs> That's okay. I'm a very jovial person. And I can, I can, I can put a joke into anything. But this is, this is sort of important, isn't it? It's okay. As her condition worsens, even that good sense of humor is fading. I'm Dana Lewis, reporting for Insight. Well, to discuss this further, I'm joined by Nahid McAdam, who is a clinical fellow at University College in London. It's discussing dementia that we're going to have a conversation about it now that we kind of need to do more about, don't we? Yeah, Not absolutely. just with the elderly, but with the next generation down? No, definitely. Um, you know, dementia is a, a growing problem worldwide. It affects 7% of people over the age of 65, and the risk increases with age. And worldwide, as you said, there's about 47 million people worldwide in 2015 who are suffering from dementia. And that figure is predicted to be increased to 66 million by 2030 and 115 million by 2015. So 2050. So it's a, it's a growing problem. And the frustration for medical scientists is that it's underreported. Is it people feel that they're reluctant to ask the doctor, why am I getting a little forgetful? Absolutely. So there is still this perception that um, memory problems are just a part of normal aging and why go to your doctor about something that's just normal. Uh, but we would you know, counteract that and say that actually the earlier you get help, the more, you can, the more benefits you could reap. Um, memory problems can be caused by a lot of different things, vitamin deficiencies, depression. So it's important that you see your doctor early and rule out other causes. And if it is dementia, there's a lot that you can do to treat it, especially if it's picked up early. Is there? because there's a perception that it's incurable. So I guess that adds to the reluctance to admit it, because you don't really want the doctor to say, well, you've probably got a bit of dementia or it's maybe Alzheimer's. You don't want that diagnosis, do you? So all the more reason to keep it to yourself. Sure. So there is this perception, again, that there's nothing that you can do about it. And while it's true that there is no cure, there, there are a lot of medications, psychological treatments that can help to manage the symptoms. So uh, we would urge anyone who has difficulty with their memory to really to see their doctor and get help as soon as possible. What kind of intervention can the best practice? Where, where are we at with the treatment of Alzheimer's? So I think first of all would be ruling out physical causes, as I've just mentioned, or depression, because those are you know, highly treatable. If it is confirmed as Alzheimer's, then there are medications that can help to slow down the progression. The, the ones we usually use are things like Aricept or cholinesterase inhibitors, mm. which slow down the, the progression of the illness. There are also psychological treatments such as cognitive stimulation therapy, which is a, a group therapy, weekly sessions where it's a type of brain training, if you like, but delivered by a specialist, a trained person, where you uh, take part in different exercises such as uh, sharing memories or reading. And that's been shown to have the same effect as a medication. So that's we normally give people it? both. I mean, it makes perfect sense. We try and keep our bodies fit by exercising your muscles. You need to keep your brain fit by exercising your brain. I mean, am I right in thinking if you do the crossword regularly, that can help? So we know that, um, that keeping your brain active through social interactions and through um, yeah, things like crossword, reading, these things uh, can have a beneficial effect. We also know that early education is actually protective. So people who have at least had um, a primary school education, gone on to further education, they're less likely to get dementia later. 
is there an incidence um, scale through strata of society? Does it, for instance, if you're fairly well off, if you're affluent, if you are achieve better standards of education, are you less likely to get Alzheimer's or does it affect everyone equally? I think there's, there's, so there's genetic factors and lifestyle factors that can play a role. I think there's not, it's not so much about the quality of the education, but just being in education for longer is protective. So if you're perhaps in a lower social class and are less likely to have an education, then that could have an impact. But it's not the social class per se that, that's having the effect. So one thing you can definitely do is as you approach, um, what, 60s or 70s, the trouble is the whole population globally is, is on average getting older, isn't it? We are Absolutely, living longer. Yeah. Um, so here's a challenge for all of us, I suppose, both within deciding what to do for ourselves and within our families and so on. But keeping active, in particular brain active for longer or permanently is a good thing to try and achieve. Keeping brain active, but um, we also know that factors such as if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes, if you're obese, if you don't exercise physically, and if you smoke, these all increase your risk of developing dementia. So the key thing is to work out how to tackle those risk factors, because it's estimated that up to 30% of dementia could be actually preventable if we tackle these core risk factors. As much as that? That's extraordinary. Yeah. That sounds like a list for heart disease patients, though. Is, this, is there a similarity in symptoms? Yes, there's a lot, there's a lot of overlap between the cardiovascular risk factors and risk factors for dementia. So if you keep your heart healthy and keep your brain healthy, you're doing your best to fight a genetic pattern. But look, if your mum or dad suffered from dementia, are you most likely to suffer from it too? You're more likely to suffer from it, but it's not inevitable. So we think that actually there's a lot, of, uh, a lot you can do about these modifiable risk factors, and there's a growing interest in that to see how, how much impact and at what stage of your life you should be targeting them in order to prevent uh, developing dementia because even if we can delay the onset of dementia by five years that could halve the prevalence of dementia worldwide which would be a massive impact. And there is collaboration worldwide? I mean our medical companies not fighting each other over this. There is actually a consensus let's try and find better science, better cure. Absolutely. There's research going on all the time into uh, preventable, into modifiable risk factors as well as into the underlying mechanisms of the disease and that's, that's ongoing and international collaborations are definitely in encouraged and, and going on. Well, that's an encouraging note on which to finish our conversation. Uh, Heed McAdam, thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is Insight coming up after the break. Air turbulence, a scientist here in the UK predicts we'll be seeing a lot more turbulence in the years to come, but how much impact will this have on the way we travel?